So let me introduce. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Mark Edwards. So he's professor in physics in the Georgia Southern University. So Mark works in the theoretical simulation of the physics of cold atom gases. So he's uh, uh, in-depth analysis of the superfluid flow in matter wave circuit has been uh, very instrumental for uh, for the field. Okay. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk at this wonderful meeting. I, I, I hope very much that we will be able to see each other face to face in two years, um, e either in Benask or somewhere. Um, the, uh, so my talk is about interaction and anharmonic effects on the performance of a dual Sanyak atom interferometer rotation sensor. And uh, the uh, Stephen Thomas, whose name is here in red, is uh, the lead student on this project. And uh, I'm also acknowledging um, collaborators, Cass Sackett and Charles Clark. So me, can, let me get going here. Um, just a quick outline. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the uh, Sackett interferometer experiment. Um, and then I'm gonna explain how the rotation speed is extracted from the data of the experiment. Um, and then uh, our attempts to model this experiment uh, by solving the rotating frame gross pidievsky equation. Um, but the, uh, um, and, and how a direct numerical simulation is very challenging. So we turn to an approximate variational solution for this equation. And then, I'm going to describe how we apply the uh, this model to the, the sequence of steps in the in the interferometer, um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, all that all the interferometer stuff um, operation assumes a harmonic potential, but in fact there are R and harmonic terms present, so I'm going to describe that and uh, our uh, what we did to model that. And then I'm going to describe some uh, effects on the interferometer performance of the finite size of the condensate and also effects of interaction. So I, I don't think I have to sell this group on um, the value of atom interferometry or, or uh, different experiments where we use Bose-Einstein condensates in sort of atomtronic settings. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump into the um, uh, jump into describing this experiment. So um, in the Sackett group at uh, the University of Virginia, they they did an experiment um, in the last year or year and a half um, where they created a condensate, the Bose-Einstein condensate, at the center of a harmonic trap, ideally harmonic trap. So you can see here, so this gray, this gray circle here represents the initial condensate. Uh, and then um, this thing was split along the y-axis by um, uh, counter-propagating lasers into uh, two clouds that one moving up the y-axis, one moving down. And then ideally each of these would stop at the same time if we had a perfectly harmonic potential. And then at that moment, one quarter period of the, uh, of, of the trap, then they are split using the same laser for top and bottom by another pair of counter propagating lasers. And this sets, this splits each one, each one of these two clouds also into two and sets them in counter orbiting uh, pathways. So the red, so you have the two red counter propagating clouds at the top uh, forms a single interfer, uh, single, sorry, it's hard to say, sing, single Sanyak interferometer. And then the one, the blue one at the bottom is a second interferometer, um, mostly independent, although uh, the clouds that the different, the red and the blue clouds can 
uh, meet each other along the way. Um, so then when after one orbital period, the if we just look at the red, think about the red one for a minute, um, they come back and ideally overlap and then they're split one last time called the final, I'll call it the final split. And that produces, uh, if you just look at the top, uh, or actually the bottom might be better here because of this picture. Um, what that does is it creates four clouds at the top and four clouds at the bottom. Two of those clouds are nearly stopped and overlap. And so if you see this, uh, and, and then a few milliseconds later, an image is taken. So this, if you see here, it's hard to see these, there's a, a cloud here, there's a cloud there, and then there's a big, uh, big dark one here, and there's um, what look like three black dots on the bottom, but the, the large one is two overlapped clouds that have been stopped. And once, they, once they've been stopped, uh, if you wait, they'll fall back towards the center because of uh, there's a harmonic trap present. And, the other two continue around the circular path. So um, the, uh, I have this, sorry. I have this bar in the way. Okay, now I can see it. So again, the top, inter the, the top clouds, the red ones are one interferometer and the, the blue ones form the other one. Okay, so I'm going to show you a movie, I hope. Maybe. Hmm. I think my, uh, my power, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm going to show you this very quickly because uh, it, it's, it's kind of a slow, this actually is, is pretty much to scale. So um, if we, this shows now the effects of rotation but it's highly, highly exaggerated. So if we have a um, here, so these things come out and they experience Coriolis acceleration. So they swerve off of uh, the, the top path and then, and stop. And then once there, they're split again and they, uh, we can, we can enjoy this thing going around. They go around once and they end up overlapping again. Wait for it. They're not where they, they're not where they started. They've rotated over. And so this, at this point, the final split has, uh, it is applied. And what happens is the, the, the wave function you can see here um, starts out uh, at, the, at, the, at the second split. Um, it splits it into states like this, which evolve around and come back and they've acquired uh, phases. So the plus, the plus here represents the top interferometer and the minus is the bottom. So um, if, I, uh, if I decompose these this way, the red states here um, are coupled by the final state to zero momentum, and the blue states are coupled to uh, the, the same momentum that they had. And so if I then want, if I calculate, if I want to calculate the fraction of atoms that are stopped, that you can see that that probability is going to be the cosine squared of one half times this phase that's accumulated. Uh, and this would be the phase, uh, phi plus, for example, would be the phase accumulated by the top interferometer. And phi minus is the phase accumulated, phase difference between the packets of the bottom interferometer. So this can be easily uh, extracted from an, uh, analyzing an, the final image. Um, I can count the pixels in each one of these three, if I just look at the top one, I can count the number of, of dark pixels, all three of these together and divide the, the number of pixels in the middle one, the stopped one, and that will give me the fraction of stopped atoms. And so in the experiment, the, uh, um, 
the procedure for finding the, um, well, okay, I'll go, uh, I'll tell you what the experimental procedure is. In, in the experiment, the procedure for um, extracting the rotation speed is that they make many measurements of S plus and S minus under the same conditions and they plot, and there are many noise sources that uh, apply to, to these, these measured quantities. Um, and, the, and, and the idea is that all of the noise sources that uh, are not due to the rotation are common to both. And so if I can extract the difference between the phase difference of the top interferometer minus the phase difference of the bottom interferometer, those common modes will be rejected. And uh, except for the rotation, which acts oppositely. So by plotting S plus versus S minus, these points land on an ellipse. When, I fit, when they fit the ellipse, they can extract this delta phi directly. And so um, this was all explained in a, a paper in PRL that came out last year. Um, and so this difference then should just be due to the, um, the Sanyak phase. So each one of these will have a Sanyak phase uh, plus stuff, and but the Sanyak phase will be opposite for the top and the bottom. And so then you can uh, set this delta phi directly equal to the Sanyak phase, which is proportional to the mass of the a condensate atom, the area of the interferometer, um, and to the rotations, the, the measured rotation speed. So this this comes. Uh, I'm going to come back to this uh, story in, in a little bit, but um, this expression here basically comes from saying that uh, the phase accumulated, the Sanyak phase accumulated, is the uh, integral over the uh, of the Lagrangian over the classical path. So um, this, this result is, as far as I understand, depends on the fact that the Lagrangian is quadratic. So, um, so I'm gonna come back to that at the end of the talk. Okay, um, one of the things that uh, happened was that if they just, um, allowed the, uh, the, the four cloud, what I call the four, four cloud flight time, that's this, from the second split, they allow that there's now two clouds on the top, two clouds on the bottom. And so uh, letting them, they, they allowed them to uh, uh, fly around until they overlap again. And uh, if you just had a harmonic potential, you would get, um, you would just take one one period of of the trap, um, but it turns out that um, in that case uh, there was no overlap for that thing. So what? So they varied the uh, the four cloud flight time until they found uh, the overlapping um, maxima in in the in the noise of the of the measurements. And uh, that uh, that they reckon was uh, gave them the best interference con contrast. Okay, so um, it turned out that this this optimal time was a, a whole. It, it was like two whole mill, two and a half milliseconds, maybe, maybe two, um, longer than the uh, the trap period. And so this this difference was due to uh, and harmonic terms in the potential. So we'll come back to that in a minute. So we wanted to model this um, to see if we could, uh, by, by modeling, suggest improvements in, um, the, uh, in the experiment to um, uh, suggest changes in the experiment that would prove, improve the sensor performance. So, um, our assumption was that this this was pretty much a classic um, 
Bose-Einstein condensate in a harmonic trap or some kind of power law trap. And uh, there's no reason why the uh, gross pedieski equation shouldn't give you pretty accurate results. Um, in this case, uh, since this, um, the purpose of this whole thing was to be, uh, to, to uh, measure the, the speed of rotation of the frame in which the experiment was carried out, then we should be using the rotating frame gross pedieski equation uh, to, to model the behavior of the condensate. And so in that case, I'll, I'll want to point out that uh, the, uh, ro the speed of the rotating frame is an input to the model. And so um, what, what we set out to do at first was, excuse me, um, to input, make an input to the rotation speed, which we call the true rotation speed, and then carry out some um, procedure to extract a measured rotation speed and then compare those. So, um, but we ran into a problem. Uh, if, we, if you look here at this, this circular uh, orbit that these things are, that these are condensate clouds are going around, the, the radius of this cloud is two tenths of a millimeter, which is, um, as you can kind of see here, what the, the, uh, the ratio of the condensate size to the radius of it orbit that it's traveling around means that you need to take some uh, some pretty large volume to begin with and and to realize that uh, this experiment was meant um, to have a sensitivity that was on the order of the Earth's rotation speed. But that's not anywhere near state of the art. Um, state of the art is probably three at least three orders of magnitude smaller in the um, than than Earth rotation speed, and so in order uh, in order to get down to that, they're going to have to um, make this uh, the area bigger. So they're going to have to have a bigger orbit and um, various, and maybe allow allow the uh, clouds to go around more than once. So um, this this turns out to be uh, practically intractable uh, for a direct solution, numerical solution of the rotating frame GPE. Um, so what we did was, uh, and if someone knows how to do it, uh, that'd be great. <laughs> I don't. Um, and so we turned to a variational model um, where we assumed that the trial wave function was that uh, if the condensate is split into multiple into multiple clouds, say in sub C clouds, then each cloud is modeled as a 3D Gaussian with moving centers and, and time dependent widths with, um, with, with appropriate linear and quadratic phases that allow these, the centers and the widths to change in time. Um, and uh, we, we did some work on this in general uh, a couple of years ago. Um, where we derived equations of motion for these variational parameters um, in, in the rotating frame where that works for any external potential. And so basically these are the equations of motion. Here are the three for the centers. And this is the, you know, this, this is three equations written as one for the widths. And these things couple together um, in this, where there's something which we call a variational potential, which is essentially got two terms, uh, one for the external potential and one for the uh, interactions. And the uh, interaction part is always the same, but the external potential, um, variational potential, which just depends on the variational uh, widths and, um, and center coordinates, is basically the expectation value of the real potential um, within this trial wave function. And so we thought we, we can uh, apply that to a harmonic trap, and that's pretty easy. And these are the equations of motion that you get. Um, and they look pretty similar uh, to 
just standard harmonic trap uh, equations, except that there are these extra terms that only uh, are only non-zero when two different clouds overlap. And uh, that these, these equations are pretty, that these uh, functions are pretty horrible, so I'm not gonna worry about them. Um, and uh, so we were able to uh, solve these equations can be solved on your phone, <laughs> um, but even even with those terms, but uh, without. But it turned out that we also uh, the, the Sackett group had um, done some ex careful experimentation to characterize the potential that they actually had. Uh, they had a top trap, um, and so they, um, they they published another paper uh, where they had looked at. Um, the presence of n harmonic terms. So these first two terms, oops, back up. First two terms are the harmonic part and uh, pretty much classic, classic cylindrically symmetric top trap potential. And uh, then the, um, uh, then there are these other terms that are the most important ones um, expanded to uh, fourth order in the, uh, um, in the coordinates x y z. So, in so response to that, Mark, you have uh, ten minutes. Okay, great. So we we uh, we did a, a power law potential uh, for our um, you know for our equations of motion, um, enhancing the the equations of motion for just the harmonic oscillator, and so. Um, in order to apply this, we uh, um, we apply that this this model works for any number of clouds. So we first used a one cloud model for the original condensate, and then two clouds for the first split, and then four cloud model uh, for the the final split. And um, then the uh, at the end of the just at the uh, time of the final split. You're going to, your wave function is going to have four terms in it, and this um, and so from this we can calculate. Come on, here we go. From from this we can calculate the uh, fraction of stopped atoms, um, and we can go through this procedure that that I talked about before to extract the uh, measured. So there's a this final wave function depends on the true rotation speed. And then we extract measured rotation speed uh, from that. Um, and let's see, but that actually did not work uh, very well. And I'm gonna come back to that. Um, but the first thing we needed to do was to find the optimal time. So what we did was we varied the four cloud flight time and calculated the fraction of stopped atoms within the model. We found that um, indeed the an, with the anharmonic terms present, uh, we needed a longer, we didn't quite, uh, the, the, in the experiment, they got 107.7 milliseconds and ours was a little lower. So um, we don't know if that's due to uh, um, different, slightly different anharmonic potential, but um, at least it's in the correct direction. And um, so then we used this procedure to calculate the true rotation speed, um, the calculate the measured rotation speed in terms of the true one that was input. And that this did not, that this procedure did not work. Um, and so uh, we've, so what we did was we, we measured, uh, sorry, we measured, we, um, we calculated the, uh, fraction of stopped atoms for a bunch of different true rotation speeds. And then first for a harmonic potential and then fit it to this, this function here, uh, the uh, fit function, fit parameters are A and B. If A is one half, then uh, this becomes cosine squared of one half B omega um, by trig identity. And so we found that there was, there's a, it's too hard to see here, but for the harmonic potential, and especially when the anharmonic terms are present, 
there's a gap here so that this, this A, when we fit it, did not actually equal one half. And, but the B turns out to be exact, B times omega turns out to be exactly the Sanyat phase. And let me uh, also point out that here, we're just applying this analysis to one of the interferometers. Uh, we don't have any noise in the model. So um, there's no reason to, uh, the, the, uh, the bottom and the top interferometers give the same answer. So this turns out, this, this gap, we looked at it uh, more closely than me, um, uh, turns out to be due to finite size and interaction effects. Uh, we were able to, um, if we take our uh, harmonic potential and ignore interactions between diff different clouds, then <clears throat> we were able to get an exact expression, which did when in the limit where the rotation speed is much smaller than the trap frequency, then it turns out to give you the Sanyak phase here. But there's this exponential that appears, which is due to the finite size of the condensate. And when we looked at this in the for the case of um, for the case of the full interactions, we were able to, uh, but no rotation, we were able to identify several contributions to this um, to this gap. And uh, one of them had so two of the terms have to do with the relative velocity at the moment of the final split. So you can have two clouds overlapping, but if if their centers of mass uh, aren't moving it just before the final split, moving it twice the, 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 the split speed, then you're going to get some contribution in this exponential. And then there's another term which has to do with the fact that when they're overlapped, they, they are also expanding or contracting. And this will cause a relative velocity as well, un, unless they're perfectly overlapped. And then Mark, also yeah. there, hmm. yes? Yeah, well, about four minutes. Okay. Yeah, uh, excuse me, interrupt. Works great. Okay. Uh, and then there's also uh, cloud width effects that disappear if you're perfectly overlapped because this X1 and X2 are the um, X coordinates of the uh, clouds at the moment of the final split and x1 dot and x2 dot are the x components of the velocity of the two clouds. Um, so then um, the, uh, so I'm gonna uh, tell you quickly um, some other effects of N harmonicity that we discovered uh, uh, from the model. Um, the first one is that there is, a, um, if you're perfectly harmonic, then you're, orbit will take place in uh, a plane parallel to the xy plane. But if you're, if you have anharmonic terms present in particular, this one, this term here, you can see that if you go partial V with respect to Z to get the Z component of the force, you'll get uh, an out of plane uh, pushing force, which is only is non-zero unless you're exactly at the origin, and so that's what happens here. Um, there's a small push out of the uh, of the xy plane. Um, this can lead to um, this phenomenon that we saw and that they saw in the experiment where. Um, the uh, clouds don't overlap at the end. Um, and then the, uh, and then the, the last uh, effect is that it's going to alter the, what, what happens when you split these clouds, they, they start to contract because the original condensate was balanced against the confinement, the number. You split it into two half condensates. Now the confinement wins because the, uh, repulsion is reduced. And so they, they oscillate back and forth uh, in and out 
as they go around the around the orbit. Um, and then uh, so and, and those are the um, the effects of the uh, uh, it, it, other effects of uh, the anharmonic terms. Um, uh, so let me just quickly uh, say that in the future, we're going to look at how these anharmonic terms uh, contribute to an error budget for the uh, for the interferometer. And we're also going to explore, we already started doing this, uh, using larger condensates. This, this was the original motivation was that uh, the second condensate was 10,000 atoms, which is pretty small. Um, larger condensates will give you a better signal to noise, but they won't um, be, uh, they, they, the interactions will become an issue. And so um, the, uh, I, I'd also like to take one minute to say that I, I've also been working on some other, uh, another, um, an, another project with um, Tom Bland, Nick Prokakis and Alex Yakimenko um, regarding the transfer of uh, circulation between uh, adjacent um, ring condensates. And uh, so these, the, Tom has a poster, I think that will be this Thursday and Alex, this poster I think will be next week. So don't miss those. And I'm going to put up my group slide and thank you for your attention. Many thanks, uh, Mark. I think we have a, a couple of questions from uh, Horst Schmidmeier, so I try to allow him to talk. So, so I, have, I have one one general question. So, uh, if you split the condensate, there's quantum noise in the splitting, and because of the laser, track, there's quantum noise in the splitting, like in a beam splitter. Okay. And, okay. and because you have an interacting system. The, this quantum noise we give you give the two counter propagating atomic clouds at different atom numbers, and that will accumulate a random phase, which is different for the two Sanyak interferometers. So they give you something that is not common mode and does not drop out. Sure, I mean uh, that that like, and, and like and I was saying, not in the GP calculation. You cannot calculate that in GP. You have to calculate okay, the well, that's, and then that's counted in the GP. The quantum noise is not included in the GP. Even well, in that, that's a fair. Well, so what's the question? So the question was, is how much is this quantum noise? What what would that limit you the sensitivity of this of your interferometers? So uh, the the answer is uh, I think you 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 told me your answer already. I I I don't know because I've only used and uh, I've only gone to, to the GPE level. Um, the, uh, it, it, it's a very good comment. I appreciate it. I, I, you know, it's something that um, the, uh, the, the Sackett group, I think, has, uh, has estimated. But I, I don't know what, uh, I don't, if they, if they told me about it, I don't, I don't remember. So it, it might be, it, it might be a big problem. Yeah, so, so do you know how many atoms they have in the condensate? 10,000. 10,000, okay. It's a very small condensate. And interaction energy, how much is that? Um, the, uh, I mean, it's- and The chemical uh, potential. It's small, uh, the chemical potential, I'm not sure. Uh, it should be, um, you know, I think it's I think it's small compared to the 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 external potential. Um, I mean that that the interaction the interaction energy is very small. So yeah. um, I mean that that was that that was the purpose of using a very small condensate was that they you know because there are, there are other things that happen too is that during the orbit different clouds will pass through each other. And uh, so there's interaction going on there. And also there's another, um, there's another source of interaction uh, when 
in the in the first split, when you make a condensate and then you split those there, that as the two clouds move apart, they push each other. So this also will push the the clouds that move out and stop out to a slightly larger radius because some of this interaction was converted into kinetic energy. And so that will also cause a difference um, in, uh, uh, it'll cause a, a difference in the, um, the radius of the, of the circular orbit. But, but I think those, those sources are actually common mode. So uh, I don't know the answer to your question of uh, how important the quantum noise is, but it, it, is, it is something that needs looking into. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions? Hi, Mark, how are you? Thanks for the talk. Hi, Gerhard. Thanks for the thank talk. Thank you. Actually, uh -huh. I, I, I rose my hand and then you answered my question already. I was, I was actually asking about the interactions when the, um, when the condensates meet again, because in your talk, you mentioned that the CAS might have to improve the sensitivity by doing multiple rotations. So yes. I was wondering, can you can you calculate the effect of the interaction? Is it possible to to model the system even when the atoms pass through each other? Yeah. It, well, so this is in this is in our uh, this is in our model. In fact, I skipped over this slide, but here you can see there are two there are two types of sort of GPE level interactions. Uh, they're self interactions where the individual clouds expand and contract. And there are interactions um, when uh, during a, a Bragg fault splitting. So one is the original condensate gets split in two and these push off of each other. Um, and the other one is uh, clouds that pass through each other. And if, if, they, if they pass exactly through each other, then I think that there's no effect. But if there's a glancing, if there's a glancing collision, then I think there can be. Um, I think that the, that this can actually alter the shape of the orbit. So, um, and and these actually, I think this two cloud thing is actually not common mode. This first one, this Bragg splitting is, but not not the second one. So I think it affects. Uh, the clouds in opposite directions. Anyway, we're, we're this is on our list to study next. And 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 if I, if if Luigi allows me a follow up, so looking at the experimental images, um, I could see any effect of expansion of the cloud. Is this too short to see um, at the, the the cloud expanding at the, at the optical resolution or? The... Well, it's not. Uh, so they take a picture. The picture is taken with the um, uh, the harmonic trap still on. So there, there's no there's there's no ballistic expansion. But the um, here, let me see if I can go back to. The, but there there is expansion and contraction because of the. Uh, uh, yeah. So. The fact that these clouds are that you know once you split actually once you split this one this now there are eight clouds here four on the top and four on the bottom and so there the number of atoms is eight times smaller than the original condensate which was enough to balance the con the harmonic confinement and so you get um, oscillations that look like this. So here, here's here's typical. This is the x width, um, and this is in micrometers. So you can see there's an oscillation, but it's it's maybe um, you know 30 percent uh, of the initial. So there's not there's not a huge uh, oscillation in the in the size. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. I think sure. there is a, we have the time to make last question to Wolf. Maybe you can unmute and uh, ask your question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mark. 
this was Getzing speaking. From, uh, yeah. your, your oscillation would be a shape oscillation, right? A chemical potential driven shape oscillation. So it would not be at the yeah. harmonic frequency. Does that matter? Um, so it, you know, this is something we're just, we're, we're, we're actually looking into the possibility of matching these uh, oscillations. Um, I don't think that it matters um, for, uh, I, for sensitivity. I, I think, I mean, it, 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 if these oscillations were a, a lot bigger, then, then yeah, I, I think so. But the size, these, these oscillations you see here, for example, um, one of the things that happens is that when you come back around after one orbit, these uh, condensates have to the condensates have to re-overlap and they repel each other. So you have to, depending on how big they are, this that the same amount of that the same four cloud flight time will give you know give different answers for the repulsion at the end. So maybe when the, the uh, so when if if it was the case that the two clouds were um, big, you know, if you were at the top of one of these oscillations, say, uh, at the time of overlap, the repulsion would be lower and you'd be able to perfectly re-overlap. But if you were at the bottom, so now they're smaller and they repel more strongly, they won't perfectly overlap. And so in that sense, it can make a difference um, okay. as far as the, uh, uh, you know, the size of the condensate at the end of the at, at the the point where they make the final split occur so because it, it would break the symmetry between the two the splitting yeah. the combination interesting right so you started out splitting splitting one into two and they pushed off of each other at the beginning um back back here here this red guy gets split into mm -hmm. two and these two push each other apart as they fly away. And then you want them to come back and re-overlap. And if they come back and perfectly re-overlap, then all of the extra kinetic energy that you got by pushing off at the split here gets eaten back up by the repulsion mm -hmm. to re-overlap. Um, so in, in a spherical, so spherically uh, symmetric trap, that wouldn't be a problem because then the, the shape of station frequency will just be twice the, uh, the harmonic yes, frequency. Okay. Sure, then in that case, that would be, you know, if it turns out they're the same size when they re-overlap as when they started, then you don't have a problem. And to a certain mm -hmm. extent, you can engineer that, I think. Cool. You can yes. make the orbit a certain size and you can, uh, maybe you can modulate the interactions. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Okay, I think there's no more time, Mark, unfortunately. Thank you very much okay. for your... Perfect, no. thank you. Thank you so much.